Hey everyone, it's Harlan Kilstein, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar today. This is going to be a really good webinar. There's going to be a lot of information. Some of the information is going to be controversial information, um, but the information that you hear can have a major impact on your fur baby's life um, it's, and, and their health. So this is a super important thing. We're going to be covering information that very likely you've never heard before covered anywhere. Um, we're not backing away from any topics. This is going to be a really important one. Now, so I want to welcome you. My name is Harlan Kilstein. I am the top dog. Do not tell that to my dog, Kamba. I am the top dog at the Dogington Post. And with me on the line are uh, incredible staff, uh, Brandy, who writes most of the articles, and Brooke, who does some amazing graphics and research and put together this entire webinar. Now, this webinar is coming to us through our good friends at uh, Merrick Pet Care. Uh, Merrick is the leader in the real pet food revolution, food worthy of a fork. Now, we've been talking about on our site, we've been doing some research on supplements and what's in it and coming from China. And everybody knows about the problem of food, dog food coming from China. That's never a question when you're dealing with Merrick because Merrick, of course, uh, does not use any of that um, stuff that you find in the cheaper, um, you know, dog foods. You don't see the recalls that you see with the other brands. You don't see that. This was pulled off the shelf because it had a dangerous ingredient in it. Whoops, sorry, we risk your baby's health. With Merrick, it's real food. And as we go today, you're going to be, uh, and, and you learn what there is to share, I want you to, to know that um, one lucky participant is going to get a voucher for a 25-pound um, bag of grain-free real Texas beef dry dog food and uh, or two cases of grain-free 96% uh, meat canned recipes. Plus, you're also going to um, um, plus you're also going to um, um, they're, they're going to make a donation in your honor to National Mill Dog Rescue. So um, we're really happy to to be here. Now, our guest today is someone really special. Special. Her name is Dr. Melissa Brookshire. She's a graduate of the University of Missouri College of Veterinary Medicine. After graduating, she practiced in a small animal hospital in Kansas City. Melissa and her husband opened their own companion animal hospital in 1998 until its sale in 2005. Now, Dr. Brookshire served as the director of veterinary services for a large pet food manufacturer for four years uh, prior to creating North River Enterprises in 2007. Now today, she's gonna give us the scoop on today's popular dog food trends. Now, these have been discussed on our Facebook page, on our site, but this time, um, we're really going to, to get into them, including the things that we're gonna be talking about and nobody else is really talking about are, what's the truth about raw diets? What's the truth about GMOs? What's the truth about grain-free, organic, all-natural dog foods? So let's get this transferred over to Melissa, and let's get going. All right, very good. Thank you, Harlan, for that introduction, and thank you very much to Merrick Pet Care and the Doggington Post for having me here tonight, and thank you to all of you who are out there listening. I am very much looking forward to presenting this information to you. Um, these topics that we're talking about certainly are trends and controversial trends or controversial topics. Uh, what could be better than a night filled with trends and controversy? So as Harlan said, I was a practicing veterinarian. Um, I've worked in companion animal and small animal hospitals. And I left the practice world to work in the pet food industry. And I've been in the pet food industry for 10 years now, so I have a lot of insight into uh, the way foods are manufactured, the types of ingredients, from not only a veterinary standpoint, but also from the pet food industry standpoint. 
So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about the pet food industry. The pet food industry is huge. About $20 billion are spent in the United States alone every year on pet food. And interestingly enough, the grocery market is still the largest segment, the place where the majority of pet food sales occur. Now why I say this is interesting because the types of foods that we're talking about tonight, natural foods, organic foods, holistic foods, grain-free foods, these types of foods are not traditionally found in the grocery market. They're found in specialty pet stores, um, the major pet, pet chains, but they're, they've not been found in the grocery segment. What we're starting to see now, though, as the popularity of these types of formulas grow, we're seeing the introduction of these into the grocery market. So it'll be interesting to kind of follow this and see if more and more of the natural and holistic brands will have a presence over in the grocery segment, or we'll see the grocery brands growing, or if we're going to pull all those natural and holistic shoppers over into the other categories. It's an interesting thing to watch. So really what the basis, I think, for all of the trends that we're seeing in the pet industry as a whole, not just pet food, but the pet industry as a whole, is based on humanization of our pets. We have moved away from being pet owners. Just a few years ago, we called ourselves pet owners. We didn't call our pets fur babies. We didn't call ourselves pet parents. We didn't call ourselves guardians. So this has been an interesting transformation, and it certainly has impacted the industry. You can see the picture here. This is a little dog wearing a coat with a, a fur collar. And this is something that just a few short years ago we wouldn't have seen. Now, from a veterinary perspective, the whole pet parent revolution, the guardian revolution, this is something that's actually been a little bit alarming. And the reason for that is because the words guardian, when we talk about pets, are legal terms. And it puts a whole nother level of responsibility on the care or for the care of that pet, not only by the pet owner, but also by the veterinarian. And there's concerns that some things that we are able to do in veterinary medicine will go away because of this guardianship issue. So it certainly sounds nice, and um, pet parents, of course, that's not a legal term, but the guardian term is. So that's another thing that's interesting to watch, how the veterinary community evolves to this new status of pets. So I put some pictures here. This is also something that we wouldn't have seen a few short years ago. We're dressing our pets up at Halloween. We're taking our pets out in a stroller when they can't walk on their own. We're carrying our pets and purses through the airport um, on the planes. And we're even giving our pets birthday parties, pet-friendly birthday parties, of course, with homemade treats. Humanization, like I said before, is really driving many of our food trends. We treat our pets completely differently than we did before. Now the question that we have to ask, are these trends really in the best nutritional interest of our pets? And that's what we're going to focus on as we move forward. So the, of course we know that cats are carnivores. This is a well-known fact. We all talk about it. They're designed to be meat eaters, and they thrive when they eat a diet that's, that is composed primarily, if not all, from meat. Now, dogs are actually omnivores, and this is kind of a raging battle. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, are dogs carnivores or are they omnivores? And there's been a recent study that was published it's actually pretty interesting. What the study found is that the digestive system of the domestic dog has changed over time. It has actually adapted to the diet that we have chosen to feed our pets. Many years ago, before dogs were domesticated, they had to forage or catch prey to consume, and they ate a diet that was very different from the diet they were fed once they became our faithful companions. Even thousands of years ago, when in Egyptian times, we fed from the table. 
and these dogs adapted to that diet. They were fed scraps, and this this occurred for many, many years. The pet food industry is actually relatively young in the grand scheme of things. And now we find we've evolved from feeding table scraps and allowing the dogs to forage to meet the rest of their needs to feeding complete and balanced prepared foods and maybe supplemented with some home, home prepared foods. But we are feeding differently and the dog has adapted to be able to best utilize the nutrition from the sources that we're giving in these foods. Okay, so this is a trend that I wanted to mention. I know there was a webinar from Dr. Ernie Ward that really focused on obesity. And I just wanted to bring this up again because I think that this is really a tragic situation. And it comes out of some of the things that we've actually been able to do in the pet food industry. Many of our dogs are overweight or obese. And this is something that is ever growing. Despite the fact that veterinarians are working to bring attention to it, pet food companies are working to offer solutions for people, for pets that are overweight, um, or to prevent pets from becoming overweight. And really what we see is a concentration of nutrients in pet foods that are available now. The calories that are available from one cup of food are much higher than they have been in the past. So this means that the portions that we need to feed are shrinking. Dogs and cats are just like us. If they consume more calories than they burn, then they're going to gain weight. If they burn more calories than they consume, then they're going to lose weight. When you have a diet that you're feeding that's very energy dense and you're accustomed to feeding something that's not so energy dense, but you continue to feed the same volume, your dog or cat is going to gain weight. And reducing that volume down to what is actually an appropriate amount of calories sometimes seems like such a tiny amount of food that we can't possibly believe that that's all our dog or cat needs to eat. So that's really what's driven this. Um, you know, we all like to treat our pets. There are a lot of different kinds of treats out there um, and a lot of great, great types of treats. But what we forget to do is consider in the overall scheme of the calories our dog or cat are eating per day, the, those treats have calories. So it's kind of like um, me snacking on the Halloween candy that's still on my desk. I have to take into account the amount of candy bars I have before I go home and eat dinner. Okay, so I just want to throw this kitty cat in here. The focus of this really is mainly on dogs, dog nutrition, and the controversial in the overall pet food industry. But I just wanted to throw in this kitty cat. This looks like the cat that I have at home, or one of the cats I have at home. Um, and cats really, we do know that they're carnivores. They are very mysterious creatures. We don't have as much research available on cats as we do on dogs. And really the research that we have available in dogs is sorely lacking, but it's getting better and better. But we do know that the same trend is occurring in the cat population as it is in the dog population, that more and more cats are overweight or obese. And unlike dogs, very few of us can put a leash on our cat and go for a walk around the block to burn those extra calories. So we have to learn how to manage nutrition for these pets to keep them lean and fit. Okay, so instead of going from smallest to biggest, I'm going to start at the top with what I believe is the top trend in pet food. And it'll be interesting to see if everyone agrees with this. But what I think the top trend is, is grain-free. And I would really say that the grain-free movement is a revolution in and of itself. The grain-free formulas, when, when grain-free first became a pet food concept, there were maybe one or two companies that had a formula or food that was available in this category. Now what we're seeing is nearly every company that has high quality, holistic or natural types of foods are adding foods in this grain-free category. Now the interesting thing about grain-free movement is it's brought along a lot of other trends with it. We're going to get into that as we move forward. Okay, so some of the questions or misconceptions that come up when we're thinking or talking about grain-free food is that grain-free foods are free of carbohydrates 
or that grain-free foods are very low in carbohydrates compared to diets that contain grains. Now what we have to understand is when you're looking at a complete and balanced pet food, there are nutritional components that add up to 100%. Those nutritional components are protein, fat, carbohydrates, ash, moisture, and fiber. So those six nutrients make up 100% of the food. So let's just assume we're talking about a dry food and the fiber is relatively low, the ash content is relatively low, and the moisture is going to be relatively low, about 10% or less. So those three components we're just going to take out of the picture. So what's left, the bulk of the diet is protein, fat, and carbohydrates. So when you have a high level of protein and a high level of fat, you're going to have a low level of carbohydrates. And a lot of the grain-free foods that are out there, we do see high levels of protein and moderate to high levels of fat. So those foods are going to be lower in carbohydrates compared to some of the other more traditional diets that you might find on the shelf that have lower protein and fat levels. But what we also have to understand is that there are a lot of grain-free foods that are coming out into the marketplace that have moderate levels of protein and fat. Let's say 24, 25% protein, which is a moderate level, something you see in a, in a standard maintenance type of diet, and maybe even 12 to 14% fat. So these diets that have the moderate levels of protein and fat, they're going to have much higher carbohydrate content and really equivalent to a diet that contains grains that has the same level of protein and fat. What we've done with the grain-free revolution is we've replaced carbohydrates from grains simply with carbohydrates from vegetables. And what this has done has driven the movement into whole foods. Whole foods are things like potatoes, peas, things we saw in the previous slide, sweet potatoes, the carbohydrate sources or the carbohydrate portion of the food. The other thing that we're seeing with the whole food movement, which is very closely tied into the grain-free movement, is the use of fruits and vegetables. Now I see the corn in the picture and I know that most of the foods that we're talking about in this category don't contain corn. Um, and also the grapes in the picture, which we know, we all know not to feed our dogs grapes. But the rest of the foods that are here, we commonly see these things on pet food labels. Maybe not the hot peppers down in the corner, but the rest of them. Berries are very high in phytonutrients and antioxidants. We all know that. We hear it for us and now we hear it for our pets. All of these colorful vegetables offer high levels of nutrition, nutrients that are found only in these foods. The purpose of having these types of ingredients in the foods that we're feeding our pets is to provide our pets with these same nutrients. Now, berries are, are a good example. There's some research that's been done on blueberries and beagles. Um, so I actually have science behind the fact that immunity is enhanced when pets are fed berries, fruits, foods with phytonutrients. There was a study done that actually compared two groups of beagles. One, that were, one group was fed blueberries every day, and one group did not get any blueberries. And when they, let, when they did certain blood tests to measure the level of the immune system function, they found that the dogs that ate the blueberries had a much more efficient, better, stronger immune system. So this is really a concept that we have brought over from the human nutrition world to the pet nutrition world and it kind of goes counter to some of the things that we're hearing. You know, some of the things that we think about when we talk about why there are grain-free diets. We say that grain-free diets are more like what the dog would eat in the wild, which we've already talked about the fact that our dogs are not the same as the dogs that live out in the wild. They've adapted to living with us. But what we've done with these, the addition of these foods is brought these same concepts in. So dogs really could eat these foods, would eat these foods, would have benefits from eating these foods. So some of the things that we talk about, the reason for grain-free, don't really make sense. They're almost contradictory to the reasons that we see these fruits and vegetables in the foods.
Okay, so another thing that comes along with the grain-free movement is the introduction of unique ingredients, unique protein sources, things that we maybe haven't seen in food before. And wild boar, I think, is a really good example. And I wanted to talk about this a little bit because it's a little bit controversial, not only in the pet food industry itself, but in the regulatory world that regulates the things that we use in pet food and how we name them. Pork is obviously from pigs. Wild boars are a type of pig. And the meat that would come from them technically would be pork. We used to equate pork or pork meal with low quality diets, with diets that were maybe very basic, very inexpensive, um, something for the very budget conscious. But now we're seeing wild boar and pork meal as a common combination or more common combination in some of these high priced, um, high quality pet foods. So it's been an interesting um, circle that we've seen, that we've witnessed uh, what has happened by changing up a little bit, you know, of course, wild boar, it does have to be from actual wild boar. You do have to prove to the regulatory folks that you did harvest the meat from wild boar, not just domestic pigs. So it is something that is accurate on labeling. But it's interesting that this is truly the ingredient pork. Now I wanted to talk about unique protein sources because this is something that also has really come out of the grain-free revolution. Um, it started in the veterinary commu community where um, diets were made for pets with severe allergies. And these diets were kangaroo and oat or um, duck and potato, things like that. And what has happened is the consumer has driven a demand for these unique protein sources in an everyday diet. So the interesting thing that I want to talk about here is lamb and rice diets. Way back when, lamb and rice diets were something that you really rarely saw on the shelf. And veterinarians used those lamb and rice diets as an alternative for pets that were suffering from non-responsive allergies or skin irritations. And then what happened is the lamb and rice diets grew very popular, um, mostly from the marketing efforts of the pet food industry. So more and more people fed lamb and rice diets to their pets, and the lamb and rice diet was eliminated as an option for veterinarians to use for these pets that had extreme sensitivities or allergies. So then what were developed were these unique diets with unique protein sources, like I mentioned before. And now that we're seeing those same things enter the mainstream realm of pet food, what needs to be understood is that pets with allergies, pets with food allergies, while they're a very, very tiny segment of the pet population, those with true food allergies is a tiny segment, Pets with allergies is a much larger segment. And pets with allergies, because their immune system is having these um, inappropriate reactions to proteins that they're exposed to, so even a flea allergy is a protein allergy. They're allergic to a protein that's in the saliva of the flea that bites them. So all allergies are based on a protein. Um, what is happening is we're feeding, let's say, a duck and potato diet to our dog and our dog's been eating this for two years and our dog has flea allergies and dust mite allergies which are the two most common allergies that we see in dogs so we're feeding this duck and potato diet think that we're doing the, the best thing for our pet because our pet has allergies but our duck our dog never had allergies to the chicken and rice diet we had been feeding or the beef diet that we had been feeding but we switched to duck and potato well then, because of the chronic exposure to the duck and potato diet, now our dog has an allergy to this particular food. That is how allergies truly develop in dogs. It is from exposure over and over to the same proteins. And the body starts to look at that protein that's being introduced into the body as a foreign invader. And that's where the allergy response is triggered. 
So adding these unique protein diets into the mainstream marketplace, while it's great for dogs that have sensitivities or allergies, it does give pet owners a, uh, or pet parents a, an alternative where they don't have to purchase a veterinary diet because they do know that the veterinary diets are extremely costly. But what happens is because so many dogs are now exposed to all these unique proteins, we're really getting limited on the things that we can use in the dietary management of food allergies. So it's something that um, is driven by, by the consumer without the full knowledge of, of food allergies. We hear a lot of times, they do a lot of consumer support, um, veterinary consumer support in the pet food industry, and we hear a lot from, from consumers. They call up and they say, you must have changed your formula because my dog is itching and my dog hasn't had any problems while eating your food. Well, what most likely, most likely it's not the food at all, it's something else in the environment, but if it is truly a reaction to the food, it's most likely that that dog, because of the, the long-term exposure to that particular food, is now allergic or sensitive to the food. You know, the other thing, actually, so this is, GMO is next, this is the most controversial topic, but I do want to bring one other thing up about the unique protein source. Um, what we're also seeing is other unique ingredients. We're starting to see things like garbanzo beans, um, quinoa. A lot of unique ingredients are going into these foods. So not only do we have the concern that we're, we're eliminating the list of foods that we have as an option if a pet does have a food sensitivity or food allergy, but there also are some global concerns as far as food sources. Some of those, some of the grains, quinoa, um, and some of the beans, legumes, they are used for as a primary food source in some of the third world countries. So as the demand grows for these unique ingredients and price becomes more um, flexible, then that supply moves over to the people who are willing to pay the higher price, which tends to be um, the, the more developed countries. So there are some concerns that have been mentioned uh, of what the demands in America for our own foods um, and also for our pet foods, what that could potentially do to some of the food supply. Okay, so when I first found out I was um, presenting tonight and talking about um, all these different topics, GMO was the one that um, probably had me the most nervous. GMO is the hottest button topic, I think, right now outside of China, as Harlan mentioned earlier. There are two sides on this. There are very few people in the middle of this argument. There um, are people for, who... First, can, can, what is a GMO? Okay, so GMO, the initials stand for genetically modified organism. And what that means is that a gene has been removed from something else, another plant, or from that plant itself, and altered with genetic material, and then re-implanted in that plant. So it's changing the genetic code of the plant. What the purpose of this is, is to make the plant typically one of three things. Either less susceptible to a pest, so fewer pesticides can be used on the field. Um, so environmental concerns have driven some of this. If our plants are less susceptible to pests, we don't have to put as many chemicals on them to keep the pests off. Some of them are actually altered to be more accepting of the different chemical pesticides that are used. And that's where a lot of the controversy comes from, the concern about um, a lot of people have heard of Roundup Ready corn, um, so it's actually more able to respond to those particular pesticides that are applied. And the other thing, or the other things that, or the other purposes, I guess, for genetically altering a plant is to increase the productivity of that plant, so a single plant can produce more food, for example, and then also to um, make that plant hardier. So it's 
better able to survive drought conditions, for example. So if we're introducing um, some rice into an area and the conditions aren't quite right, we can alter that rice plant to make it more able to grow under tougher conditions. But where this movement started was actually with rice. And what the drive was for altering the rice was to increase the vitamin content. And this was because where the rice was being introduced, the people didn't have enough vitamins in their diet, particularly B vitamins. So the rice was altered to have a higher level of these B vitamins. And that was really where the opposition to the genetic modification of plants started. It was with the rice that was being introduced to help prevent vitamin deficiencies in this third world country. So it sounds like a great benefit. So a lot of people were suffering from symptoms and this was a solution that was offered. But the concerns with genetic modification is, you know, what exactly does that do? If I eat food that's been genetically modified for 20 years, what does that do? And that's where the unanswered questions are. Thank you. So the purpose, like I mentioned, is altering these plants to produce more food. We can give crop plants to places like India where they have a huge population and an inability to grow adequate amounts of food to feed that entire population. So we introduce plants that can produce more food or are hardier to the con growing conditions in India. The concern that a lot of people have with some of those things is that the plants, because they're altered, they actually destroy the land or the soil that they grow in. Um, so that's both sides of the argument. The people in favor of genetic modification say the plants are producing more food, they're helping eliminate the hunger problem, um, they're not destroying the, the ground or the environment. And the people on the opposite side, the people that are against genetic modification, say that these are destroying the land and that they are um, potentially dangerous if we consume them over a long period of time. Okay, so this is a really long quote. I'm not going to read it, um, but what's interesting about this, you can read it while I'm talking, um, there was an individual, Mark Linus, and he's actually the force behind the anti-GMO movement. And what's very interesting about Mark is that he changed his story, so or changed his beliefs, and he came out with that change. So what he's saying here in this quote, this was when he actually apologized in a, in a speech for being anti-GMO. So it's very interesting. Someone was at the heart, at the, the source of this argument has now changed his mind and feels that genetic modification is not the issue that he was making it out to be and that it's continuing to be made out to be. Now, there are plenty of, the, of other people who are against genetic modification, so it's not like he was the only one, but he was really the driving force behind the movement. So and this is just an, an image that I thought was kind of funny about what, what we're doing. You know, you can find all sorts of different funny pictures, and I found some that were not very appropriate, but they were kind of funny to look at today when I was looking for images of genetic modification. So this is a, a tomato being injected with a substance and modifying that tomato to be something else. The fruit or the grain itself is not being modified. The plant itself is being modified. So for harvesting something from the plant, the science supports the fact that the plant may have had the genetic modification, but the, um, the material that's being produced by that plant does not necessarily have that same modification or any modification whatsoever. So this is um, just a quote about genetic modification, um, genetic engineering. Those are really two different things. Genetic engineering, um, is something that's more invasive, more intensive. It's more than just modifying the gene. Um, and this is where I think the word um, or the name frankenfoods comes from. A lot of folks that feel that genetically modified foods are dangerous will call them frankenfoods um, because they're like putting together Frankenstein um, with this genetic modification. 
There have been a lot of things in the news about genetic modification coming from labeling requirements. And really the biggest movement, the first movement, was in California, Proposition 37, and that did fail. Um, what the requests are in this movement, in this legislation that is coming before different states, is that companies be required to label any food that contains even a tiny fraction of genetically modified ingredients to put that on the label, contains genetically modified organisms, or yes, GMO. So this labeling requirement is something that it failed in California. It's still, um, it was recently voted on in Washington. And there are some reports that it passed, some that it failed, more that it failed than, than passed. They're still waiting on some of the ballots to come in, the mail-in ballots. But what the concern is from not only the food industry, but also the pet food industry, is that we don't really have a complete understanding of what the impact is on this. Uh, there are a lot of ingredients, a lot of plants that are grown in fields that are next to fields that are growing genetically modified plants or um, fruits or vegetables. If those things are the same, there can be cross-pollination. So there may be a fraction of truly a, a GMO-free field or crop that does turn up with a, a tiny amount of, of genetically modified material from cross-pollination. So it's something that's a real challenge for the industry, it's a real challenge for scientists, and it is extremely controversial. And I found that you know, there are, are people who really are against GMO ingredients, people who are okay with them or don't really care, and then the people that are really for them. Um, so what I think we'll find as we go forward, there will be foods that are GMO free. Um, the, there will be a price to pay, of course, just like anything. Um, when you have to go through the process of certifying that your ingredients are all GMO free, when it becomes a labeling requirement and there's additional testing required, then those ingredients, of course, become more expensive and then the food itself becomes more, ex more expensive. Okay, so moving on to yet another controversial topic. <clears throat> this is, um, a raw food is something that is not a new, um, a new way of feeding pets. They really, the first big um, driver behind raw foods was Alan Billinghurst and the BARF diet, the Biologically Appropriate Raw Food Diet. And what the concerns are, so I'm going to do the negative side first of the raw diet or raw diets. There are a few concerns, some from a veterinary standpoint and, and some from a human health standpoint. So raw diets are, are primarily composed of meat and bones um, and then also with other additional foods added, sometimes grains, fruits and vegetables, um, some things cooked of course, but um, mostly everything is raw. Um, I actually tried the raw diet for my dogs for a period of time because I was very curious about it. And um, one of my dogs did very well on it and one of my dogs did horribly on it. Um, so it's very interesting and the diet was complete and balanced and it was the same food feeding both the dogs but they responded very differently to the diet even after a long period of time feeding it. So that's something to consider as well. There is not one diet out there in any brand or any classification that is going to work perfectly for every dog. It's just not possible. Dogs, while they are more similar than humans as far as their um, nutritional needs or similar than each individual human, they do have different needs and different abilities to metabolize ingredients. So anyways, back to the raw food. Um, I mentioned that the diet that I was feeding was complete and balanced. The problem is a lot of the veterinarians have concerns with pet parents that don't necessarily have a proven raw diet. Um, they don't necessarily know that what they're feeding is complete and balanced. 
So this can result in nutritional deficiencies. And where we're really concerned certainly is with dogs that are in a state uh, where they have higher needs. So pregnant or nursing dogs, um, athletic dogs, young dogs, things like that. Another concern that we have outside of the nutritional inadequacies or nutrition, potential nutritional deficiencies is the human health factor. So we all know that when we have raw hamburger on our counter and we're making burgers or making meatloaf or have raw chicken on the counter that we need to clean the area where that raw meat was, wash our hands thoroughly, wash all the utensils and that's something that's quite easy to do and we're just ingrained to do that. When we're feeding raw food to our dogs, we're putting these foods in different areas. So you may give it to the dog in the house, they move around with it, or they may just eat it you know, in a bowl in the kitchen. But we're exposing multiple areas of the home to potentially to uh, pathogenic bacteria. The other concern is that dogs will have these bacteria <clears throat> on their fur, on their face, on their paws, and they also will shed higher levels of bacteria in their stool. Uh, now some studies have been done that have actually shown that's not the case, and not all meat has high levels of pathogens or any pathogens, but raw meat is going to have some level of pathogens if you're exposed to it enough. So the problem with these dogs that have it, have these pathogens, Salmonella, E. coli, on their fur or their um, body somewhere is that they're going to contaminate the home and then we're going to come in contact with them and potentially get ill. Um, really, things like Salmonella, dogs, they can get sick from it, but they don't necessarily. They can ingest the bacteria and not become ill. They can be carriers of salmonella. So a dog can carry the bacteria in its digestive system and never be ill with it. But they're putting that bacteria into our environment. And people are much more susceptible to illness and, and potentially very serious or even life-threatening illness um, when they become ill from, ex from being exposed to these bacteria. So that's really where the issue is there. Now there are commercially prepared raw diets, and I just want to touch on that really quickly because as we as was mentioned earlier by Harlan, there are there have been a lot of recalls and um, not a lot, I shouldn't say a lot because that's not really accurate. If you look at the number of human food recalls compared to pet food recalls, the pet food recalls are very, very tiny compared to human food recalls. <clears throat> But what the majority of the recalls have been for recently is salmonella, whether it's treats or food. What's happening is these foods are being tested for salmonella. Now raw foods, like I said, are almost, um, not always, but often going to be contaminated with bacteria. So that's a concern for producers of raw foods. They have to have what we call a kill step. So if we take in some fresh chicken and it has salmonella in it, we cook it in the extrusion process or the canning process to make dry kibble or canned food. But if we're making a raw food, obviously we don't cook it. Um, but there is a process that's used called HPP. Um, it's a high pressure pasteurization that actually can kill the bacteria. But the raw food purists don't believe that that's truly raw food. So this is just an illustration of a um, proponent of raw food, I guess. Uh, she would eat it herself. She's surely going to feed it to her dog. Um, and this is just something on the favorable side of raw food. Like I said, I fed it to my own dogs. I did have one dog that did very, very well on it. Um, I think that in the right situation, in the right home environment, with with nobody that's at high risk, like a small child crawling around the floor in close contact, face to, to mouth contact with the, with the dogs, I think that it can be something that's appropriate. But it is important to do it with the right knowledge um, and have the right tools. Okay, so now we're going to get into um, natural foods and organic foods. <clears throat> and the first thing that I wanted to talk about with natural foods is the segment of the pet food industry that is natural foods, that truly meets the natural definition, is actually quite small. It's really surprising. 
Um, but it is growing, and it's growing much more rapidly than what we consider the more traditional diets. And I would put the grain-free diets into this natural food category. But it is actually a regulatory definition. There is a definition for natural. And this definition is in the official publication of AFCO, which is the American Association of Feed Control Officials. This is like the Bible for pet food industry. So this, this book tells us what ingredients can be used in pet foods, um, tells us how we need to label things, what things we have to put on a label, what we can't put on a label, all those sorts of things. So what this book tells us a natural ingredient is, is a feed or ingredient derived solely from plant, animal, or mind sources, either in its unprocessed state or having been subject to physical processing, heat processing, rendering, purification, extraction, several other things, but no chemical processing. And it also cannot contain any chemically synthetic ingredients <clears throat> to be considered natural. So what we're seeing now on a lot of packaging is the words natural dog food with vitamins and minerals. The reason we're seeing this terminology is because we have to add synthetic vitamins and minerals to pet foods to make them complete and balanced. It's, it is extremely challenging, if not impossible, to make a dry kibble pet food from all natural ingredients and meet all of the nutritional requirements of the dog that's going to be eating that food. So the, the ingredients that you see in the ingredient list that have big names that maybe you can't understand or don't recognize, not that you can't understand them, but that you don't recognize them, those are typically the vitamin and mineral supplements that are added. So the foods that are out there that have natural terminology on them, all of the ingredients in that food are natural, with the exception typically of the vitamins and minerals. So that means that they've not been exposed to any chemical processing. Maybe they've only been cooked um, or, or they're fresh or frozen. Okay, so this is a little bit different from organic. Almost like a step up, I guess, from natural. Organic is something that's regulated in the human food industry. Um, in the pet food industry, what has happened is this has kind of languished. There's been a lot of discussion over how to handle organic in pet food. What's happened is we've simply adopted the same guidelines for human food um, for our, our pet foods. And this is in regards to the ingredients and the labeling requirements. So, you know, of course, one thing with organic food, no, these are all fruits and vegetables, obviously, no chemicals, no pesticides, no fertilizers, except natural compost type of fertilizers, can be used to grow or produce these foods. And then once they're harvested, there can't be any additives to preserve them or maintain freshness. So these are truly natural, holistic, organic ingredients. Now the problem with this is, um, if any of you have ever tried to grow your own vegetables organically, um, as just kind of a lay person, it's very difficult to get a large volume out of the plants without having a lot of destruction from pests. And this is the real challenge in the organic industry. It is difficult to get a large volume of fruits and vegetables or large volume of organic foods, so that drives the price up, of course. And that's why you see the price very, very high on organic foods. It's because the ingredients can't be purchased at the same prices as natural ingredients, so that it comes with a trade-off. You know, certainly there are a lot of things, a lot of benefits that are thought to come from organic, but then there are a lot of people in the opposite camp who feel that really um, organic foods are not necessarily more healthy, or maybe they have a list of the dirty dozen, uh, certain foods that are the worst as far as their ability to absorb and hold chemicals that are applied to the outside. So 
to be more budget conscious, they may focus on those 12 foods and keeping those out of their diet and just only um, eliminating those while tolerating natural foods from the, um, for the rest of their diet. So I just want to touch on this labeling here. Um, there are three different ways that organic foods can be labeled. 100% organic is one. What this means is that every component of that particular food, so if this is a, a, a complete balanced food, for example, every single component is organic. There can't be anything in there that is not certified organic. And what's required when a food contains 100% organic labeling is three different things. All ingredients must be certified organic. All processing aids, so anything that's used to process the food, has to be organic. And there has to be a certifying agent or certifying body that's listed on the label. Now the next category, which we see this category in pet food, we don't see the 100% organic category in pet food, um, unless maybe you might see it in a homemade type of diet or something that's being sold in individual meals. Um, but as far as large-scale commercial pet foods, um, we're not going to see that. We do occasionally see foods labeled simply as organic. And what that means is that 95% of the ingredients are certified organic. Any non-organic ingredients that are in that particular food must be on the approved national list that's put out by the National um, Organic Program, and there has to be a certifying agent on the label. And you do see this in pet food sometimes, that again, this is um, typically a, a big price jump up from natural, high-quality foods. So it's something that takes a real financial commitment, especially if you have three large dogs, like I do, who eat a lot of food. Um, this is a big price jump over a um, high-quality, holistic, grain-free, or even non-grain-free diet. And then the final categorization is the made with organic. And this means that 75 or 70, excuse me, 70 percent of the ingredients are certified organic. The non-organic ingredients must not be handled in any method that is restricted or excluded by the National Organic Program guidelines. And again, the certifying agency has to be listed on the, on the label. So when you see a food, a pet food out there that has organic on it or has made with organic ingredients, that not only requires the ingredients to be certified organic, but the facility where that food is being made also has to go through a certification process. And that is something that is a stringent process. You know, certainly now with high quality foods, high quality pet foods, we're seeing facilities that are pristine. You walk in and um, you know, there's no dust, there's no dirt, it looks like the sleekest manufacturing facility you've ever seen. And that is what we're seeing with these high quality pet food manufacturers. But if they want to produce organic food, it's a whole nother realm, a whole nother list of things that they have to comply with in order to meet the organic standards. So certainly that's, you know, there's two reasons why you see the higher price. One is the things that the company has to go through to get that labeling and also the, um, the higher price of the ingredients. Okay, so that is it for the material that I had prepared. Okay, well then we're going to go to questions. And remember, one of our questions is going to win someone some dog food. So here we go. Lots of questions. Uh, does wet dog food cause more plaque? Um, not necessarily. What causes plaque is the um, food staying on the surface of the teeth and allowing the bacteria to grow and that not having any way to be brushed off. Now dry pet foods are allowed to say uh, reduce, reduces plaque and tartar or helps clean teeth and that's simply by the mechanical action but actually there, even that is not really adequate or ideal. What we really need to have is some kind of dental treat or tooth brushing, um, which is actually the best. Brushing your dog's teeth every single day is really the ideal way to maintain plaque-free teeth. 
Okay, okay. next. Yeah. Kathy asks, I'm a first time old dog owner and after reading and researching decided rough was best for my dog. However, in the back of my mind, I'm still concerned my dog is missing nutrients. What supplement would you recommend to ensure my dog is not missing anything? Well, Kathy, I would tell you that the best thing to do for your, um, for your dog is to find a veterinary nutritionist locally or on the American Academy or the Academy of um, Veterinary Nutritionists, acbn.org. There's a list of veterinary nutritionists. And these veterinary nutritionists are taught how to formulate diets. So if you're feeding a homemade raw diet, you can give the recipes to these nutritionists and they'll let you know if they're complete and balanced. Now to recommend a supplement without really knowing what's missing can cause problems because you may end up over supplementing something and under supplementing something else. You know, typically with homemade foods, we'll recommend a one centrum vitamin, you know, just the centrum vitamins that we would buy at the store. But with this situation, um, you don't necessarily know. Raw food is a little different than the typical homemade diets, and they always should be balanced by a nutritionist. Okay, thank you. Um, our lab suffered for years with intestinal problems. After I finally figured out he couldn't eat grains, he lived the remainder of his life very healthy. This was way before grain-free food. Okay, that wasn't a question. Ryan says... As you mentioned, dogs are omnivores. What's your take on vegan diets for dogs? I spoke it to one pet parent who raved about how his dog has thrived on a vegan diet. Well, I personally don't believe in vegan diets for dogs. Um, they are omnivores. They are designed to have a portion of their diet come from meat. However, it is possible to balance a food using all vegetables or all um, plant sources. So you can use plant-based proteins to give that protein component to the diet. But certainly the, the vegan realm is something that um, you know, certainly wouldn't enter into that on a homemade basis without a lot of advice from a nutritionist. And um, you know, like I said, there may be individual pets that do well on that, but on the whole, that wouldn't be my choice or recommendation. Okay, in simple terms, Nancy asks, what are the best ingredients to look for in dog and cat foods? We have two small dogs and two cats. We want to feed them quality food from reliable sauce. Thank you from Nola, Willie, Miss Kitty, and Ruffle. <laughs> well, that's a, that is a tough question to answer because there's not necessarily a specific list of ingredients that you're going to need to look for. Um, what I would look for is something that's in the category. Like we mentioned Merrick. Merrick is sponsoring this webinar, one of the sponsors of the webinar. They have high quality foods. You can look at the labels of the different types of foods that they have. A lot of them have fresh meat, um, whole grains or uh, vegetables in the grain-free diets fruits and vegetables added for that extra phytonutrient boost. So really looking for that blend of ingredients is the best thing to do. And one thing that's really gained popularity, which you didn't mention, is the rotation diet. And this is something that a lot of dogs tolerate very well, rotating the type of food or even the flavor or formula of food that you feed so that if your dog's not necessarily pulling every nutrient they need from one formula, you switch to a different formula and that balance comes back. So that's another thing to look at for pets. It's a little bit more challenging to do that for cats, but for dogs, they typically do pretty well with that. Okay. Um, Mealing asks, since I've tried my dog on different brands, both wet and dry, I find the recommended amount seems to be way too much. I just wonder why. Well, there are a couple different reasons for that. Um, one is that the feeding guidelines are calculated based on 
um, different formulas. So there are different formulas that, that veterinarians or pet food companies use to calculate the amount of food that's going to provide the right amount of calories. Now some pets, just like some people, um, are going to be able to eat less and still maintain their body weight, while some pets need to eat more to maintain their body weight. Um, so really what those guidelines are is kind of what I'd say guidelines for a moderately active adult dog. Um, and so if your dog is not as active or uh, a little bit older or has any kind of metabolic issue, then the amount of calories that need to be fed is much lower. Okay. Um, what about a diet of some dry, high quality dog food with additional protein? Um, certainly adding additional foods or ingredients to the diet, there's no problem with that. What you want to make sure to do is watch the calorie intake and make sure that you're giving an adequate portion of the complete and balanced diet because adding a protein source is not giving a complete addition to the diet. So you really want to replace a relatively small portion of the diet with that protein addition. And one thing to remember about proteins, when you talk about uh, a piece of chicken or a piece of beef, um, that meat is very, very high in water content. So really what you're giving is relatively low in protein. It's about 25% protein, 20 to 25% protein. So if your food that you're feeding is 30% protein and the meat that you're adding is 20% protein, you're really not adding any protein to the diet. You're diluting out the protein in the food. Okay. okay. We're going to have to round, round up because there's just so many questions. So with all of these questions coming in, um, we're going to do something really unusual. And that is we're going to continue the conversation on Merrick's Facebook page. Uh, Melissa will be there and answering your questions live, and you can actually chat back and forth with her there, typing in your questions, and she'll answer them. So if we didn't get to your question, please don't take it personally, but uh, there are just so many questions here. Someone wrote an interesting question, and that was, uh, what do you think of supplementing foods with raw bones? Well, and that's something that can be done with care. Um, you know, like I said, you have to be cautious about raw bones. The dog that I had that didn't do well actually swallowed everything whole because he's a glutton. Um, so that was an issue for him to swallow those uh, large pieces of meat and bone whole. When dogs chew on bones, they do clean their teeth. Um, you know, a lot of veterinarians will say, no way, don't ever do that. Um, you know, I think in individual cases that it's okay to do. You don't want to use a lot. It is a high calcium, high phosphorus um, supplement that you're giving. We don't necessarily want to put a lot more of those minerals in our dog's diet, but occasionally I think it's fine. Fantastic and great answer. All right, guys, are you ready? We're going to be real strict today. Um, I have to finish the question before we accept the answer. Um, so here we go. Don't type in your answer until you've heard me finish. The majority of dog food is purchased where? Susan Grayson, you are our winner. And Susan, if at the end of this, um, webinar, you will send an email with your name and address to info at doggingtonpost.com. Um, we'll get that over to Merrick and they'll be happy to get your, um, your voucher over to you as well as make a donation to our friends at National Mill Dog Rescue. We want to thank Melissa for being here today. It was outstanding. We want to thank our friends at Merrick. And remember, if you go to facebook.com forward slash Merrick Pet Care, um, you can continue the conversation. The answer, of course, was grocery stores or supermarket. So congratulations, Susan. And we will be back soon with another in this continuing series on nutrition. Only the best for your fur babies. 
Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Brandy, Brooke, Melissa, and all of you for joining us. It's been fun. It's been wonderful. And there's someone over here with four legs who swears to me that she hasn't been fed today, even though she has. And I have to take care of her. All right, everybody. Have a great evening.